good to see you all. There's a lot of people in this morning, isn't there? Uh, it's great to see so many people with us today, and uh, we're going to be thinking about how we get more chairs out in, in the weeks ahead and how we fit more people in. But, you know, one of, our, one of our key visions for this, not just this year, but for our life as a church, is that we will not just grow numerically as a church, but that we will grow in depth of living the abundant life that Jesus has called us to live. And we believe with all of our hearts that God has purposed us in, as a people of God, as the family of God, to grow in his life. Jesus came that we might have life and have it in all its fullness. And one of the things that we've done this year is that we've encouraged everybody to pray for three friends and to daily pray for them, to uh, take an opportunity every week to encourage one of them in some way, maybe do an act of kindness for them or send them a little encouragement card, and to take every opportunity to invite those three friends into a Christian community at some point during the year. And uh, so many of us are wearing these wristbands. I've got a confession to make to you. I'm new to the city, and so I'm still at the place of trying to work out who the three people are. And so, you know, I'm getting to know people at the gym and getting to know people's names and we're you know introducing ourselves to people in the community and my neighbors and so we're still working that out and maybe you're at that place but I want to encourage us all this morning just before we get into God's word just to if you're wearing a wristband just raise your hand if you're not raise it anyway and pretend and just say God I pray this this year that you will help us to let the light of Christ shine through our lives and to impact the lives of our friends impact the lives of our neighbors and our colleagues and our fellow students. Help us, Lord, this year to let your light shine through our lives. And I pray, Father, that many of us, all of us, would have the privilege over this year of leading other people to know you as their Lord and their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to talk about the finished work of Jesus. There are some things that are still going on, and there are some things that are finished and complete. If I was to think of a title, I would say job done. It's complete. It's not like those DIY projects that some of your husbands are in the middle of doing, and they've been in the middle of doing them for a long, long time. But Jesus has completed some stuff. He's finished some stuff. And uh, Scripture says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't say the gospel is the access to power. It doesn't just say the gospel gives you a gateway into experiencing power. It says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is a transformational experience in our lives. And Jesus came to proclaim the good news or the gospel of the kingdom. I'd like you to turn with me, if you have a Bible with you, or a, an iPad, or a phone, or one of those paper versions that you might recall, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at quite a lot of verses this morning, and to those of you who um, haven't got a Bible with you, the words will appear on the screen behind us, and we're going to explore some of the things that Paul, the writer of this letter to the church in Galatia, we're going to look at some of the things that he was tackling specifically. So Galatians chapter 1 verses 1, it says this, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that's contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, 
So I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. I, a number of years ago, decided that I was going to uh, buy a very, very nice bunch of flowers for my wife. And it's, uh, it's always a nice, appreciated thing to do. And I parked up near a florist, and uh, it was just a, a, an empty pub car park. It was early one morning, and I walked across to the local florist, and I went in and I purchased what I thought was a very, very nice bunch of flowers. I, I felt really quite satisfied with myself. You know, you, it's just like, oh, I know this is going to be appreciated. I know that I've earned some brownie points here in the marriage, and... And you just feel good about yourself, you know? And so I, I walk back from the florist to the car, and I, and I just, you know, life is good. It's feeling already positive. And as I walk to the car park, things were about to change because sitting on the bonnet of my car was the biggest, burliest guy I've ever seen, all dressed in black. And he had deposited something on one of the wheels of my car called a clamp. And if ever there was a killer of a moment, that was it. If ever the balloon of romance had died at that moment and been popped, that was that moment. And uh, this guy, he looked like um, Christmas had come early for him, to be honest. And uh, he just said, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to take the clamp off your car. It will cost you about £110 in order to do that. And, uh, you know, I'll take your money now and remove it immediately. And I said, where, where are the signs? How can you do this? And he pointed to something that was high up. And uh, you know, just about could read it. It was like one of those tests you have at the opticians, you know, where the letters were so small, you couldn't quite get it. But um, I knew I was in no way around this, really, and I didn't have the money to pay, but, so I put it on a credit card without sort of being able to afford that. And, uh, and I just felt, oh, what an idiot. Why did I park there? How did I, you know, this is just such a nuisance, such a pain. And I couldn't afford to really have paid for this. But... Somebody I know heard about my plight, and they said they came up to me and they, they gave me an envelope, and in the envelope was 110 pound. And they said, "We heard about your situation, and we would like to pay for you, pay for the release of that clamp on the car." I was so grateful. You know, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to pay for my wrongdoing. They didn't have to compensate. They didn't have to give me of their ability in order to set me free from this situation, but they chose to. And the gospel is a gospel that sets us free from the consequences of our sin. It sets us free from the consequences of the things that we have done wrong, the, the rules and the laws and the things that we have missed and, and the things that we've done that we shouldn't have done in our life. The gospel Jesus came to proclaim is one that sets people free, that offers to pay the price for our sin. It says in Mark 1 verse 14 that Jesus came proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus wasn't presenting a new philosophy for the earth or a political system. He wasn't presenting to people a code of conduct or a belief system for their life. He wasn't saying that if you will just somehow join my party, then together we can make something exciting happen. But Jesus came proclaiming something that had already happened. Something that his bringing, his arrival in the earth, was um, setting the, the pitch of, of the arrival moment of good news. It was life-changing, eternal life-changing reality. And that's the good news that Jesus came to bring. But we read here that Paul some years, actually probably very soon, not to um, much previous time from when he wrote this letter, but AD 47, 48, that he would have uh, visited Galatia, southern Galatia, and he would have started these churches off. He would have preached the gospel, the hope of the kingdom. He would have said, you know, you have had your the lives, the cars of your lives clamped, and Jesus has come to pay the price and to set you free. And all these people found this good hope, that, this good news, this hope, this life transformational truth that Jesus had announced his arrival of the kingdom of God. And people would have experienced the liberty and the freedom of being set free. And then Paul carries on with his travels. 
and he begins to hear some stories. And he begins to say to them that there is a, a distortion in the gospel. Is a distortion. There are some people who are seeking to distort what it is that you understand the gospel to be. Now, distortion is a, is a really annoying thing. If you're listening to some music and there's distortion, um, as a musician, it, it drives me wild actually listening to some distortion. It's like, can't you hear that? And it just, I, I tune into it. It just captivates my attention. It removes, it can have a beautiful orchestra playing through a beautiful sound system. But if there's distortion, I hear the distortion and it spoils it. Distortion makes things unclear. It introduces ambiguity. It leads the eye or the ear away from the main thing. It corrupts the appreciation of the work that is on offer. Paul said that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But he also says that they've turned to a different gospel. That would have been a shocking statement for the readers of this letter. Can you imagine if somebody stood up in front of you this morning and said, you're following a different gospel? It'd be pretty a provocative, shocking, confrontational thing to say. You're following a different gospel. Maybe your reaction would be, no, I'm not. I'm, I've not become a, a Buddhist. I've not become an atheist. I've not become a Muslim. I, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've just been singing songs to Jesus. And I'm sure that's the response that the Christians who were reading this letter would have had. What do you mean, Paul? We're still gathering in the church. We're still singing songs about Jesus. We're still giving of ourselves to the furthering of the gospel. What do you mean? We're following a different gospel. That's just not true. Paul says, you've distorted it. You've distorted it. You've become sidetracked. You've lost clarity. You've been deceived by a distorted gospel. Paul is making clear that any gospel other than the one that Jesus declared is not the gospel. It's another message. You see, if you were to take a glass of pure water, and you have that glass of pure water, and then you begin to add some additional things into that glass, maybe you put a little bit of oil. Maybe you put a little bit of tikka masala sauce on the night before. Maybe you add a little bit of pesto sauce in there. And you say, well, it's still the same water. But it's not. It's been distorted. It's been changed. It's been corrupted by the other content that has been added to that glass. And Paul was saying, you have had some things added into the understanding of the gospel that has distorted it so much that it has changed the gospel. The gospel contains the ingredients that God has perfectly balanced. And to add or to take away from these ingredients changes the product of the gospel. So what is the distortion? Well, as I said, Paul traveled about 40, AD 47, AD 48 to this area. And uh, it seems a short time after he left that this fledgling church had been infiltrated by some false teachers. We read about these in verse 7. These are the ones, it says, there's some who trouble you. And they have convinced the church that there are a few things they need to do in order to really be pursuers of Jesus and the gospel. They say that they need to be circumcised. So why are we talking about this in today's church? There's no skin off my nose. But they need to be circumcised. That they need to fulfill the Jewish law. And it would appear that these, these false teachers are merely wanting to win converts for their own prestige. They want to win the approval 
from the Jewish authorities by showing how effective they are in converting Gentiles to a form of Judaism. We read in Galatians 6 verse 12 that there are those who want to make a good impression outwardly and are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. These were false teachers with a wrong motive. There was something selfish at the heart of their teaching that was for their own ends and their own gain. And as a result, they created a sort of sect of which they were the leaders and which would enable them to avoid Jewish persecution. Not only had this false teaching led them away from the true gospel, but it had also created divisions within the church. We're reading reading Galatians 5.15. It says, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroying each other. And what had been introduced into the church was a class system. There were those who felt that they were very good Christians because not only were they saved by grace, but now the works that they had um, deployed in their life, the law that they had lived, made them to be very, very good Christians. And then there were, there were those who felt that they were average Christians. And then there were those who felt that they were bad Christians. And there may be uh, a measure here today. I wonder if I was to ask, if we were to put these three categories up on the screen and I asked everybody to stand at which they felt was the most appropriate for them. I wonder where you would stand. Would you stand at the moment? I say, okay, this is the moment for all the really good Christians now. Would you stand? I wonder how many would. And I wonder how many would stand at the other end of the spectrum. Say, you know, I'm one of the really bad Christians. I'm one of those that just misses it, messes up all the time. And you'd stand in that moment and you'd look in envy at those who stood at the first appeal. And what they'd created in this church was a little bit of a tiered system where not everybody was the same. You see, when you introduce law, when you introduce rules and regulations, you you find that that you introduce a bit of a class system of those who achieve and those who don't. And this was a little bit like, you know, their Christianity felt that they were living out in front of a panel of X-Factor judges. And they would parade their Christianity in front of the judges who would deem whether they were good or whether they weren't. Maybe there would be a star rating next to their names. Maybe they had like those badges you get at McDonald's where it depends on how trained you've been. Where, you know, if you, if you really follow the law and you're really, really good, then you get lots of stars and people proudly walk around church on a Sunday morning displaying their star badges and everyone else looks up and says, if only I could be like that. But that is not the gospel. There is no class system with the gospel. Galatians 2 verse 16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I always remember that word justified, just as if I'd never sinned. It's that moment when the price has been paid, where the past has been dealt with, where I come before God and he has made all things new. You see, there are, there's an inclination in our life that we come to faith in Jesus, just as this church had done, knowing that they needed Christ, knowing that they needed the finished work of Christ because their lives were devoid of him, they'd lived away from him, and they had lived in disobedience to him, and they came acknowledging him that there's, as their Lord and Savior, that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for their sin, 
And they came to Christ knowing that that was a reality. But then there's something in us that finds resonance with the people of Galatia here in this church. And that is that our conscience in our life helps us to feel good about ourselves if we feel that we're able to achieve certain things. And our conscience makes us feel bad about ourselves if we miss the achievements that we set out in our aspirations and our goals. And we create what I think could be similar to uh, almost a carbon footprint offset scheme in our own lives. You know, if you get a flight today, you will often have the opportunity to be able to pay a little bit more money to plant a tree. It's the most bizarre thing. You're buying a ticket to travel to another part of the world and you're asked, do you want to buy a tree? Well, can I take that through customs with me? Just what you asked me to buy a tree for? Well, the theory is this, that your flight has used lots of jet fuel, uh, which is bad for the ozone layer. It's, it's bad for the environment that um, it contributes to the global warming. So, as an offset, you can compensate. You pay a little bit extra, and something positive will happen for the environment that will sort of balance out your jet fuel. It will make it carbon neutral. So, even though you've taken something from the earth, you've given something back. And I find that when I look at my own life and the years of sitting down with people, processing their walk with God, that we introduce a carbon footprint offset system into our own lives. That we feel we have to do an act of righteousness to offset our sinfulness. And so there was something in the church in Galatia that found resonance with that. And some people came along and they said, listen, you've been saved by grace, fantastic. Now, you still know that you do wrong things. You still know that you wrestle with your thoughts. You still know the inclination of your heart has challenges in terms of not living righteously. This is what you must do to go to another level now. You must offset your sinfulness with righteousness. And Jesus didn't come to put a label on us of being offsetting our sinfulness with our own righteousness. In fact, Jesus came because he knew we couldn't offset our sinfulness. And what happens if you begin to live in that role, if you begin to live in that world of believing that you have to offset your sinfulness with your own righteousness. You live in a world of condemnation. You live in a world of fear. You live in a world where you do not function in the purposes and call of God because you feel too bad about yourself. Or the alternative is you feel very smug and self-righteous. And you feel you're one of those ones with the five stars on. And you begin to judge other people around you. And people come into church for the first time and they feel really judged by those wearing the five-star badges. And we end up with a judgmental environment that doesn't flow with the grace of God. And Jesus came for neither of those. Imagine you're invited to a party, but you don't have suitable clothes to wear. Ladies, you can relate to that, can't you, eh? And so you begin to look through the depths of your wardrobe, nothing suitable, you begin to head to the town, to the city center, and, but there's just, you just come to the conclusion that this party is so prestigious. It's so special. It's so royal that there's nothing that you can buy. There's nothing that you can make up from your wardrobe that will be good enough 
to gain you entry. Maybe a little bit like a Cinderella situation. But rather than a fairy godmother providing you with a temporary solution, the host of the party, he offers you suitable clothing for you to gain entrance. But at first, you're a bit uncomfortable with this because it just feels like you've already invited me. I should be making my own arrangements to be suitably attired to come into this party that you're kindly hosting. So we begin to try to work it out ourselves. So we spend time saving, we spend time trying to be good enough, trying to build up enough resources in order to be able to access the right clothing to get into that party, but we just can't do it. And then we decide that after striving and working and coming to the conclusion that we're not going to be able to do it, you recognize that you need the clothing supplied by the host of the party. So you accept it. And you put on these robes that are way above anything that you've been able to afford or anything that you've been able to acquire of your own merit. And you put them on and they feel a bit strange. But you know, you look at them and you think, wow, this is incredible. I feel like a prince. I feel like a princess. And you gladly put on these robes and these clothes and you enter into this party. You think, I can't believe I'm here. This is incredible. Look at this. I'm a prince. I'm a princess. In this party. And you enjoy. But then, you begin to question your credentials of being there. You begin to look at the clothes and think, they're not even my clothes. I'm a fraud. You begin to look at the environment and everyone else looks so beautifully dressed and everybody looks so um, suitably attired and looks like they should be there and you feel inadequate about that and you just begin to look at the person that's underneath that beautiful clothing that you've been given and think, you know, I don't deserve to be here. I, I really should work harder. I need to earn my place here. And so you begin to think of schemes that you can now employ to repay your host. You begin working on another outfit, one that you have constructed. And you start trying to earn the entrance you have already been given. The Bible tells us that God clothes us with his robes of righteousness. That at the cross of Christ, there was the biggest swap ever in the history of mankind. That we brought him our filthy rags, and he gave us his robes of righteousness. That we gave him our pain, and he gave us his healing. That we gave him our sin, and he gave us his righteousness. That a wonderful exchange took place at that moment of the cross. Galatians 3, verse 3 says, Are you so foolish that having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10 says these words, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. You didn't make these clothes. This is something that God has made. This is something that God has done. This is something you've not deserved. And God has lavished his gift on you freely. And you receive it by faith. You receive it by humility. You receive it by, receive, by, by concluding that you have nothing to bring to the party. And he has everything to give you for the party. And listen, when the clock strikes midnight, it doesn't turn back into a pumpkin again. This is forever. It's a gift of God. And listen to this in verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you think that you are one of the better Christians here, then there's something of a new humility you need to find before God because it's all because of the work of Jesus, not because of the work of your hands. Because God wants it that we will not boast in our own abilities or boast in our own righteousness or boast in our own competencies, but that we will boast in Him, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Forgiver of our lives. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
We are his workmanship. I quite enjoy if I'm visiting London and I've got a, an hour spare between meetings to sometimes look in some of the art galleries. There's some amazing art galleries in London, some of the best paintings from around the world. And one thing you will find on every single painting in those galleries is in the corner, um, often in the right-hand corner, the painter um, has signed it. He has come to a, pos a position where he said, I'm really proud of that work. I'm really proud of this and I've signed it. Do you know God is the only one who's so, he's so proud of what we are becoming, not just what we are, that he signs us before we're finished. We are his workmanship. His signature is on your life if you know him as your savior. And you've not earned that. You've not paid for that privilege. He has paid for it. You see, sin, let's talk about this for a moment. It's not a very popular word today. Sin is doing things our way rather than God's way. And sin happens in our lives when we stop trusting the finished work of God in our lives and begin to attend to our own needs our own way. Galatians 5, 19, there lists out a whole load of sins. Let me just read some of them to you. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. Quite a list. And they're not exhaustive. See, all of those things, they occur in our lives when we stop trusting and stop rejoicing in the joy of salvation that is able to attend to those needs in our lives. So drunkenness, that occurs in our lives when we stop trusting that God is able to minister right to the depths of our heart and we need something else to do it. Anger happens when we stop trusting that God is in control and that he is able to minister his peace. And we, and rather than live in the joy of that, we begin to do something about it. See, sin has its origins in our hearts. In our heart. Not Doctor Who, we've only got one. Sin has its origin in our heart. And the scripture says, above all else, guard your heart. Because from your heart, sin grows and develops and flourishes. And the things I just read to you from Galatians 5, they are the expressions of sin. But sin is deeper. Sin happens when we stop rejoicing in the joy that God has finished his work of salvation and he has made it available to us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I'd like you to turn to Isaiah 6. We're going to read these few verses in closing. Very famous passage of Scripture. Just like in Galatians, that they had added, distorted. They had diluted down the truth of the gospel, so much so that it began to be called by Paul as a different gospel. And here we see in Isaiah 6, Isaiah, notable and righteous prophet, have an encounter with God says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Said it three times there, holy, holy, holy. You know, there are some times in the scripture where things are doubled up. For example, when it talks about the Old Testament about being refined as pure gold. If you go back to the original Hebrew of that, it's not the word pure gold, it's the word gold, gold. That often double emphasis is given to show that this is, this is really, really gold. 
And here, first time we're introduced to a triple emphasis. Holy, holy, holy. He's really holy. You know, he's not just a little bit holy. He is really, he's not just holy, holy. He's holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Let's just pause there a moment. We've got a holy, holy, holy God who shows up in a room. And this man who, by many of the standards of the earth around him, would have counted himself as righteous. And he, in response to the holy, holy, holy God, says, woe. That's a curse, you know, woe. Not the word that we have in lots of modern worship songs today, where it's woe, woe. We're not singing curses there. But the word woe, this is, you know, I, I am cursed right now. This is, this is horrendous. Woe is me. For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Can you imagine if that's where it ended? Do you know for many people in this city and in this region, that's where it feels like it ends? Maybe they've got a, an understanding or a hope that there is someone out there that's bigger than them. But they feel that they're lost. And you know for us in the church who have known the saving grace of God on our lives, it's all too easy for us to become really casual about that. And we come time after time to church. We come to the scriptures that we're familiar with. And it's just like, oh yes, I've been forgiven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness. Amen. Now what's next? And Isaiah, he knew that in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God, that there was a great need in his life. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from, from the altar. If just for a moment that would have been perceived potentially as a judgment, fire of judgment. Much of the imagery of fire in the Old Testament is of judgment. But the seraphim came and he touched my mouth with his coal and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. The foundations of the room shook. There are a few earthquakes we read of in the scripture. There was the one, the moment that Jesus died on the cross and cried out, it is finished, and the temple shook. And there was this veil that separated people from the presence of God. And that veil tore in two. And it didn't tear from bottom to top. This was not like a curtain that we have in our homes. This was not even like an expensive Laura Ashley one. This was like really thick curtain. Human hands wouldn't have been able to have cut this. But even if they had, they would have started from the bottom to the top and ripped it. But this curtain tore in two from the top to the bottom because God was saying that there is no longer separation. You can enter into the presence of God with boldness and with confidence. And it is not because of your righteousness. It is not because of your work. It is not because you've been circumcised. It is not because you've kept some laws. It is not because you've baked great cakes for this, for this morning after the service. It is not because you have been attending the prayer meeting. It's not because you've been given your tithe. It's not because you've been living righteous. It's because you are loved and because you are forgiven. 
We are probably bigger sinners than we dare admit. And we are probably more loved than we dare hope. God reminds us. He's not, he's not made salvation a casual little handshake and welcome into the kingdom. He's still a holy, holy, holy God. But he has done everything that you and I need to enter boldly through that torn veil into his presence. The gospel is an earthquake in our lives. An earthquake overpowers. There's nothing that we can do to stop it. And God, the gospel, the grace of God overpowers. It wrestles our sin to the ground. It removes it and we bear it no more as we sing in that old song. And we can stand free. Today is my birthday. But it's not my birthday because this morning I had a drink brought to me in bed. It is not my birthday because I've had some presents that have made it my birthday. It is not my birthday because I've had some cards. It is not my birthday because when I check my Facebook wall later, there'll be a number of birthday greetings. That's not why it's my birthday. Those things are there because it is my birthday. You and I, we're not able to enter boldly into the presence of God because of our acts of righteousness. But we are righteous because we've been able to enter boldly into the presence of God because of his salvation. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads for a moment, close your eyes. Maybe you become a bit casual this morning with God. Or maybe you've been working to become self-righteous. Maybe you've added some things to the gospel and you've distorted the truth. Maybe you've lost sight that it was grace and grace alone that has won your heart. And has made you worthy to stand before a holy, holy, holy God. Maybe you've placed too much emphasis on your own achievements. Maybe, maybe you've had a false understanding of just how holy God is and just how much you need him. I want to ask you to reflect in your hearts this morning. Say, God, I've not deserved your love. I've not deserved your forgiveness. I've not deserved your hope. I've not deserved your banner over me being love. And I am amazed and blown away. I cannot quite fully comprehend the incredible truth and the reality that you have loved me and love me today. Father, we thank you for your salvation for your gospel of hope that it's a level ground around the cross there are no superstars in your kingdom there are not those who are better than others but we're all forgiven and saved by grace and we don't worship from afar this morning Father we come boldly to you Thank you that each day we wake that your mercies are new. Thank you that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not a fear or a harshness. 
But it's your love that melts our hearts, causes us to long for you. And Father, I pray that if our lives have been infiltrated with a false gospel, a gospel of works, I pray, Father, that you will come and heal from the effect of that in our lives. Pray that we will cease from our striving and know that you are God. Pray that we will trust you and the joy of your salvation in every area of our lives. And if sin is besetting us, if sin is holding us back, if sin is taunting us, I pray in Jesus' name that we would celebrate the joy of our salvation and trust you in that area and invite you to come and wrestle to the ground that which would seek to hold us back.